and actually talking like a robot, not actual robots, people sounding like robots. That would, according to Henri Bergson's theory that we are going to spend the entire time discussing, robots would be the funniest fucking thing you've ever heard in your life. That's because they're mechanical? Yes, right? There truly is nothing funnier than a mime. Uh, a robot mime? Shields well, and Yarnell. Yeah, well, the mimes are interesting because I've seen mimes that were actually kind of tragic, but that might be a totally separate discussion. Don't you think instead of giving a, a nice overview of his theory, we should just refer to it kind of in passing and rip it down <laughs> for, for an hour? I actually love this reading, by the way, so Mark, I'm getting a different sense from you. <laughs> oh, no, I, I actually enjoyed it plenty, okay. although I heard that Seth did not. Really? So why don't you start, Seth? I mean, why don't I start? Let's give the overview. Why don't Wes, why, Wes start and give the summary? Well, maybe Jen wants to start. She's the guest. Why don't we do what we do with all of our guests, which is get a little information about them first. Hey, that would be polite. Why don't we stop talking about Jen in the third person and using them and they to refer to her? We're having an I and thou situation. I thought that that was the rule, is that we're not actually allowed to address the guest. I thought oh, that was the... good. Oh, good. Uh, Jen, welcome to the podcast. Tell us about yourself and why you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as to why I'm here, I mean, you'll have to enlighten everyone as to what the internal process was that led to my invitation. I'm not sure what I've done that merits it. But uh, my story starts when I decided to major in philosophy at Dartmouth. And I think that my idea of philosophy up to that point had been uh, sort of combative. I had been a high school debate champion. So philosophy was something you would do in 30 second increments as a weapon. And then I got to Dartmouth. I did four years of philosophy, mostly because it was the easiest thing for me to do. It was just sort of a no brainer. I said, my God, I can just read these books and write papers about them. No problem. And so four years later, you know, I graduate and I'm running a dot com and I discovered that uh, whenever I would talk to, for instance, my accountant, uh, people would say things like, wow, philosophy? And they would assume that I knew the meaning of life or had spent a lot of time talking about the meaning of life. They would then often bring up sort of new age authors that they had read who had some things to say about uh. the meaning of life. And I thought it was really interesting because I felt like what I sort of brought to the table from philosophy, if anything, was just a sort of uh, ability to arrange my thoughts in a linear manner and uh, realize that other people's thoughts are almost never arranged in a linear manner and to proceed accordingly. After I, my company failed, I started doing comedy, as you do. And I have a show now called What Philosophy Majors Do After College. And it's a show where I do the history of philosophy melded with my personal story of having a lot of very strange jobs after majoring in philosophy. And uh, that show, I take it around to colleges around the country and book festivals, librarian parties, things like that. And perform at the pit. I sure, think. I occasionally do some shows. I'm looking at yeah, your website. I occasionally do some shows in New York, but I also go around to again libraries, book festivals, colleges, things like that, and uh, you know try to convince the young people that education is hilarious. That's pretty much it. It's basically I just share Wikipedia from the stage with punchlines while wearing a costume. You actually do wear the toga. I do wear a toga. Yep, pretty yeah. much. And that's a silence. That's an awkward <laughs> silence right there. <laughs> no. no. Silences mean we're waiting for each other to be able to talk. Of we're course. being polite. That's what silences mean. Go ahead, John. <laughs> you mentioned being polite. And I think that one of the things that I get out of doing philosophy-based comedy is that everyone who shows up to a show about philosophy, or my other shows, I have a show about punctuation as well, everyone who comes to an educational comedy show or a sort of a nerdy comedy extravaganza is very polite. No one ever heckles me. And afterwards, there's a sort of a polite golf clap, and then people go out to the bar and they drink moderately, and they discuss things briefly, and then they, they go home, also quietly. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's my people. Mm. That's what I'm saying. Do you crave hecklers, Jennifer? No. And actually, I think that the idea that like stand-up comedy is only valid if you can stand up to hecklers and that part of the value of comedy is this combativeness and sort of shutting people down and, you know, I don't go to your job and knock the dicks out of your mouth. I don't like that stuff and I don't see the point. And there's no other art form where you feel like the art is only valuable if it is produced under duress. No one ever says, that painting's no good because no one was yelling at the guy while he painted it. That's ridiculous. So I think that standing on stage and talking and saying things that are funny is not made inherently more valuable by having a hostile audience in front of it. I like polite comedy. I, I believe in it. I think the hostile audience is supposed to be the inner voice for most artists. Uh, 
<laughs> you're constantly berating yourself as you're doing you know, your art. It, I listen to some comedy podcasts and the comics are always complaining not so much about the hecklers, but about getting their audience. That um, when you go and do a show someplace where the people are just showing up because it's Friday night and this is the comedy show. So they don't right. get what I'm about. The comedians get excited when they build up enough so that the people that show up to their show actually already know their shtick. Right. And I've avoided that entirely. And I've, I've solved that problem for myself by just being really clear that this is going to be nerdy as hell. And for instance, if you come to a show that I do about punctuation and you do not already know how semicolons work, you're not even going to enjoy it. There's sort of a pre-qualification stage. Would you do something like that in an open mic? <laughs> never, never. In 2007, I actually went to the Middle East to entertain the troops. And I discovered while I was there, you know, the troops, they don't care about comedy. They just want women to visit them. Really, just any women. They would like to be visited. It was true. I was told before I left, the uh, Armed Forces Entertainment, which is a division of the Pentagon, said no politics, no sex jokes. They were really specific. <laughs> so I came up with all these ways to get around it. I had all these jokes like, what do you guys think about the surge? And then there'd be an awkward silence, and I would say, <laughs> that drink's better than Mountain Dew. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had tons of That's stuff great. like that, right? And uh, I get to the Middle East, you know, I'm on some military base in the middle of Kuwait, and there's just sand being blown in your face. It's 120 degrees. I'm aging before everyone's eyes in the heat. And the first thing that somebody says to me, you know, somebody walks out, shakes our hands. And the first thing that somebody says to me is, we hope you got some sex jokes, because that's all these guys care about. <laughs> and I remember being, at one point, I'm on a stage in Kuwait. Kuwait is a dry country, and that includes on our military bases. There are several hundred armed men, almost all men. They are sitting at picnic tables on folding chairs in the desert. I'm on an outdoor stage. There's no alcohol. And they all have to hold their guns on a lot of a sort of transitional bases. There's nowhere to put your gun. You're only there for a few days. So you have to keep it on your person at all times. So I've got this audience of sober armed people. And uh, you know, it went fine. They were happy to be visited, but I kind of felt like, all right, I'm going to dredge up every sex joke I have and maybe some jokes that make me look dumb. Those are seeming to go over pretty well. You know, any joke about, oh, look, I got my eyebrow makeup wrong and it looks like I'm quizzical all the time. That's a hilarious joke. It's not really. So I, I felt that I was really kind of dredging to get some material that would work. And after that was done, I said, you know, this isn't serving anyone. Me trying to do stand-up, stand-up, just some straight-up jokes for people who don't want to see specifically what I have to offer. It's not serving them. It's not serving me. And um, I was glad that I did the job and I was happy to support the troops. But there are other people who are better at that. And I like to just say, this show is going to be an hour and a half of a woman wearing a toga and showing slides about philosophy and then talking about selling her eggs for money. And uh, it's all going to work together somehow, but you'll just have to show up. And the people who bother to show up to that, I'm not saying it's a large number of people, but they are my people. And uh, that's what I do. Awesome. I might have to cut that out and use it. That is the permanent intro to our show. <laughs> this is a, an hour and a half in a toga. <laughs> Selling egg. <laughs> to our people. That's it. Just a few ellipses. <laughs> that's all anyone needs. Exactly. That's the power of editing. Yes. That I can make that into one sentence. <laughs> so now you are a celebrity introducer forevermore. Wonderful. Okay. Until we get Lucy Lawless to record something, <laughs> and then we'll erase it. Until then. I understand. <laughs> You were recommended to us by somebody on our Facebook page, one of our listeners. I had been detailing some of my attempts to contact celebrities to get them to come on the show. <laughs> and so actually, I did want to do this episode for a long time. But as soon as we figured out that we were having guests sometimes, then this became one of those that, yes, let's try to get somebody famous to come on and talk with us. And then I saw when this person recommended you, not only that you had this philosophy specific shtick which is awesome, but that your website is actually called jennysfamous.com. So, you know, I that believe was you. A, that was a youthful moment of hubris. Uh, it was no, a long... no, it's self-fulfilling prophecy. It's... <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm a little embarrassed by that now, but Desura is really hard to spell, so it's stuck. Uh, it's too bad the audience couldn't hear you say that. <laughs> you said smegma is pretty hard to spell. Why would you say that? I don't understand that. I've lately been lording my editing powers over the other guys. Yes, he has. <laughs> it's a Nietzschean slave morality thing. It's, it's the a, it's latest a in a long line of lording <laughs> things that Mark has been doing. Yeah, I can tell that Mark has been craving the comedy podcast mm. for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's been building up material for months and months. I had and planned months. for a while just to surprise you all with the chicky puppet. 
And just after the last person would introduce themselves, then I would say, hello, it is I, Chicky. And then I would use the puppet as an alternate ego through the whole thing. But you are saved that embarrassment because I didn't want to upstage Jen. I appreciate that. We also had a pretty strident conversation about the use of funny voices after the well, last that was, recording. Yes, that was what I was thinking about that. <laughs> yes. Would somebody like to give the uh, short summary of what Mr. Bergson had to say? Actually, the first thing I'd like to get clear on is what exactly are we talking about tonight? Are we talking about laughter? Are we talking about what's funny? Are we talking about the philosophical anatomy of jokes? Well, should we talk about his book and then see where that goes from there? I mean, he calls it laughter and the meaning of the comic. and I think it's not clear that it's about any of those things. <laughs> I have a very short summary, and then someone can add to that if they like. The basic idea is that Laughter is a reaction to the perception that there's something mechanical or rigid encrusted upon the living, to quote it directly. I like that word encrusted there. So life is something elastic or plastic and continuous. And occasionally you get these eruptions of rigidity. And that's where Bergson thinks the comic comes in. And that's important because society requires this sort of adaptability and elasticity in us. We have to conform to some extent to the rules. And the comic character is the one who's kind of clueless to those rules and to themselves. And laughter is a kind of corrective that's aimed at this comic character. Basically, you're humiliating someone into conformity, which is an interesting part of the theory. But uh, So this idea of rigidity or something mechanical foisting itself upon life and society, which when they're functioning best, are adaptable and elastic. That's where things become funny. And so then he goes through all the different areas. So form and gesture, situations and words, and then finally character in the last chapter, sort of spelling out how that rigidity plays out. So that's my short summary. We should probably say a little bit about Bergson himself. Mm -hmm. He's not exactly a household name anymore, but he was back in the day. Early 20th century, yes. He was a big friend of James, later in James' life. James, comma, William. James, comma, William, yeah. Not James, comma, Henry or <laughs> James, comma, Jesse. And he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was also had a fan in Whitehead and an uh, uncertain critic in Russell. And uh, there are lots of prominent 20th century philosophers who might not have agreed with him, but took the time to disagree with him. And the list is pretty long. Well, and he was a direct influence on Husserl and Heidegger and Sartre in his book, The Imagination, that I'd read. Like A good chunk of it is him responding to Bergson, but his whole take on experience as non-atomic, that time is this continuous thing that you can't really cut up without falsifying mm -hmm. it, that, that was a direct influence on Husserl's examination of experience and uh, Heidegger's notion of sort of subjective time versus objective time, that what time is is not this thing that you're measuring on a clock that you're cutting into pieces, but is this, you know, durations differ depending on who you are and what you're doing. <laughs> and just this overall organic take on mm. life. He did also lecture on uh, Heraclitus, I read. That was where his process philosophy thing came from, and he was a direct influence on Whitehead as far as that goes, right? And we see that in here, that just what Wes was saying about the natural state of the human being this flexible, organic thing and not mechanized, and that being the key to survival. And uh, in fact, one of his famous books was called Creative Evolution, which was a take on Darwin, but emphasized the dynamism of our adaptability. So maybe a good place for me, at least, to start to talk about is understanding this business about mechanism and rigidity and what he's contrasting it with. He includes an analysis of tragedy in this and the issue of this rigidity has to do with a kind of averaging that comedy does. He talks at the end about comedy being like the natural sciences because of this. But well, we start out with this kind of counterintuitive talk of there being an absence of feeling or emotion that you're in the position of a disinterested spectator when you're laughing. And in fact, you can't have any emotion at all in yeah. comedy. Comedy is not about emotion at all. In fact, sentiment will destroy comedy. Right. It immediately turns it to the dramatic and the tragic. Yes. When you get sentiment involved or when you get any empathy, let's say, with the character on stage and you start feeling what they're feeling, then it's over. There's no more laughing. Any kind of fellow feeling at all. Yeah. 
that's yeah. sort of a strange thing to say in the sense that, well, the classic rule of thumb of any type of stand-up is that, you know, if you're trying to say something that's too weird, you know, the funny story you tell at a party that something strange that happened to you doesn't work on stage because in comedy you need to talk about things that everyone relates to. And that is a feeling. I think we're sometimes really biased when we say what's a feeling and what's not a feeling. No, like the sort of feeling of being simpatico, affinity. Affinity is a feeling. I wouldn't call it, you know, maybe empathy is a little too severe, but this feeling of you've had that experience before, we're all fellow humans. That's absolutely a feeling and it underlies, I think, most comedy. Yeah, he actually talks about that at the end. You're right. There's that idea that we actually sympathize in some way with the comic character. And then he makes this weird comment that we do it more with our body than with our mind. That's in the very last part of the last chapter. But he sort of makes it out to be this two-part process where we sort of, in the first moment, we enter into the sympathy with the comic character and we get very relaxed. We relax ourselves from any obedience to common sense, right? We sort of enter into their little absurd dream world. And then we immediately react against that with laughter, which is almost like a kind of rejection saying, ha ha, you know, so under Bergson's theory, it's we're always laughing at someone, maybe not in the case of stand up comedy at the comedian in particular, but there's always someone or something that's being laughed at, which is a sort of rejection of the sympathetic moment. When Bergson starts talking about the idea of relaxation in the end, there was this idea that, yes, there's sympathy, but that the sympathy is necessarily fleeting, which yeah. I, to me, that's the sort of thing where maybe that's a question for neuroscience rather than for philosophy. <laughs> we could see what parts of people's brains light up and for how long. But I did think that that was an, an interesting take on, yes, there's this flash of genuine emotion, but only a flash. And then the humor actually happens. What he's trying to do is sort of look at the internal logic of what is funny. And you could say, well, maybe there is no internal logic. Maybe there are lots of different kinds of things that are funny, and there's no unifying theory that you could put forth that will cover all the cases. What unifies it is something biological, laughter itself. There has to be some affinity between humor and tickling, say. <laughs> They both use laughter. There must be some common source there. Now, that doesn't mean there's just nothing at all to say about sort of what the surface level logic of humor is, but that uh, we're not going to get the whole thing. In fact, that he uses throughout the book to reject other theories. He says, like, you might think humor is just discordant ideas, but think about these couple discordant ideas. That's not funny at all. But yet I had the same reaction when looking at his, you know, he says that when a person imitates something mechanical, like my robot voice, that's going to be goddamn funny. And I'm like, well, it'll be funny if it's delivered properly. And if it, you know, if all these other things are in a row, the idea in itself is not funny. I want to take his same rhetorical thing he uses against every other theory and use it against him and say, maybe there is no unifying theory that will capture all the comic at all. But the reason why the robot would be funny is never in itself because the rigidity that he's talking about, the mechanism, is always in contrast to activity and a specific kind of activity, the activity of life. As loosey-goosey as that is, that's the contrast he's talking about. And ultimately, that's a kind of individuality that the rigidity of things that are funny for Bergson has to do with them repeating and forgetting what the actual living thing is. And it's not clear to me exactly why that's funny. I mean, it seemed like more an observation on his part, an analysis of the phenomena, a kind of phenomenology. The rigidity is in contrast to something. It's not like the robot is in itself funny, because there's probably for Bergson, there's nothing in itself for Bergson. Yeah, and it's not like anything mechanical is funny. And he does give a lot of different rules, you know, for what makes something funny. I mean, I think he tries to refine it. He's not just saying, yes, anything that's mechanical is going to be funny. Well, no, but if a person acts mechanical, that's supposed to be funny. Now, I can immediately think of some context, like if you're actually making a joke about the task you're doing being so mechanical. So let's say everybody that works at a bank decides that their jobs are so dehumanizing that they're just going to talk to the customers like robots, like their ATMs. Maybe that could be funny for a little bit, but that's a comment. Yeah, but it's not just that you are imitating something mechanical or that you're talking about the mechanical or anything like that. It's that basically there's that element of absent-mindedness where 
there's some sort of rule, especially a social rule. I mean, ultimately, this all comes down to the social. The more primal stuff that he's talking about with gestures and forms, which we'll talk about, really, in the end, will all come back to the social. So the idea is that there's these rules that we know we ought to be obeying, and the comic character lacks the awareness of himself and others and societal rules to actually obey them. And that rigidity and the mechanical part of it is a byproduct of that. And interestingly, it's that the comic character would be both a misunderstanding and sort of misapplying the rules or kind of have a rigidity with respect to the living nature of the social, Mm -hmm. but also they would have an over application of the rule. So you have both those cases going on in which they weren't responding. They were acting like a robot the way Mark is talking about, that they were being themselves rigid and not lifelike. But both those things are going on for Bergson. Like the example of the customs officer who, in going out to save people who are drowning from a ship and asking them, do they have anything to declare, right? So where the ceremonial and rule-based element of society takes over to the point where, it, yeah, it becomes a cookie-cutter mechanical application. And just as a contrast, there is a time when this kind of rigidity is actually the sign of nobility, where you are actually preserving something in the face of nature. And the perfect example would be the guys, you know, playing the music on the Titanic, right? (laughs) Till it goes down with the ship. Right. And that's not funny. That's noble, right? (laughs) And actually, he talks a lot about Don Quixote, right? Who is sort of a borderline case. You're meant to wonder whether he's simply laughably rigid or a noble rebel. And you end up laughing and crying with him at the same time. You know what I mean? (laughs) There you go. (laughs) Yeah. At the very end of this book, he talks about the way in which there's a kind of root of evil in comedy. And this would go back to the humiliation and the treating people not as individuals, but as averages and aggregates and having the dissociation from them as individuals. And Bergson mentions this scene from Don Quixote, which if you've in the middle of it, he has this big adventure where he is a guest of these nobles and they take him in and talk to him, treating him as sort of playing his game. But wink, wink, nudge, nudging with themselves. So they bring him in and knowing that he's sort of crazy and thinking of him as crazy, but treat him superficially as if he's this great knight. And in the book, he sort of buys it. But they do this in order to constantly humiliate him and and give him tasks to prove his knighthood in order to make fun of him. And the whole section of that book is incredibly painful if you have any kind of sympathy at all for Don Quixote and the fact that he's being utterly humiliated over and over and over again. It's not at all clear that if as a reader you're supposed to find it funny or why they are finding it funny and there's a clearly a kind of cruelty going on in it. So this story about Don Quixote and whether he is supposed to be a comic figure, this just strikes me as one of those things where that's just highly dependent on time and culture. And I think that might be a nice place to seg into talking about Bergson's discussions of disabled people and all kinds of other things that we don't really find that funny now. Unless you're watching Ricky Gervais or... Or, or, yeah, or the, is it the Coen Brothers movie? Fairly Brothers, maybe. Fairly Brothers. They have the whole co-joined twins movie, right? <laughs> Yes. Okay. Stuck on you or something. Yeah, like it's that. very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I miss that. I like the title. It's very funny and very endearing. It's a it's a brother movie. Greg Kinnear and Matt Damon are co-joined twins who work in wow. a uh, diner, and they have this special way of being incredibly fast with flipping hamburgers. Well, it's also sort of funny <laughs> that they would be conjoined twins who aren't identical. I'm not sure that that's a disability that we're laughing at, such as a physical impossibility. I saw a martial arts movie that had male-female conjoined twins, which also cannot exist. That's not a thing. You have to just stitch some children together at birth to make that. It's not an act of nature. And so that's sort of funny, but I just don't think it's the same kind of thing as laughing at a deformity. And so to get back to Don Quixote, I mean, this idea that you're, it's not even clear whether we're supposed to laugh at that story. And I think that's very culturally bound in the same way that when Bergson talks about why we laugh at some deformities and not others, Mm -hmm. I thought this was actually a little bit bizarre. This idea that obviously hunchbacks are hilarious. And I mean, that's, uh, (laughs) I don't know. I've never thought a hunchback was funny in real life. I mean, I'm aware that they exist in cartoons, but every hunchback I've seen in life, it just made me a little sad. A lot of them have been old ladies. And so in trying to develop an overarching theory of what kind of deformity is funny, 
I'm becoming more and more convinced that this theory of rigidity explains a lot more of comedy than when I first started reading. When I started reading, I, I kind of said, wow, this is a stretch. And I'm getting a little more convinced. But on the issue of what kind of deformity is funny, what Bergson says is deformity is that a normally built person could successfully imitate. You know, <laughs> like because we can pretend to limp, limping is funny. Yeah. And because we can fake a hunchback, hunchbacks are hilarious, which is kind of strange. I mean, I think that a penis growing out of your forehead is much funnier than a limp or a hunchback. Well, it's true. And the reason the reason why being able to be imitated is important is because it's as if it's a choice. So then right. that element of it being due to something in the character, rigidity or absent-mindedness, is important to finding it funny. At some level, we have to be able to blame the person. And so a deformity, of course, or a certain kind of deformity, like being a hunchback, isn't really in and of itself funny to a reasonable person who's thinking, yes, it's not a person's choice. But the idea is that at some unconscious level, through this strange logic of dreams that he talks about, we find things funny through this attribution of intention, even where there's not intention. It's unreasonable. It's unjustified. It's not just, but it happens. And that's the idea. And I think, of course, people have laughed at hunchbacks and they've laughed at all kinds of horrible things. You know, comedy is not always nice. It's exactly that business of choice why in Young Frankenstein, the fact that his hunchback moves... I was going to mention that, too. The reason why that's funny is because... Well, it's in Bergson's view. It's why it's funny is because it highlights this notion of he's pretending to be a hunchback. At least that's what the implication is. And it's also because it's sort of a... It's playing with the type, with the stereotype of Frankenstein's servant and Igor and all that. Bergson talks a little bit about this, about when something becomes a social meme like that, you get an added layer of comedy there. You're also making a reference to all those past uses of that comic type. So, Jennifer, would you say that due to cultural norms or something like that, when would deformity be funny? You know, I have a hard time thinking of a deformity that would be funny. And I'm sure that if I'd been born 100 years earlier, I would feel different. Well, you said a penis growing out of your forehead. That would well, be that's, funny. That's not a real deformity. A penis growing out of a forehead is a hilarious idea in a movie. I think if someone really had a penis growing out of their forehead, that's tragic. And I'm sure, you know, <laughs> I mean, we're laughing now, but their life would be ruined or they would just have it removed immediately. So I mean, it's a very fictional version of a deformity. Real life deformities are not that funny. Bergson also talks in several places about Negroes, as he says, or as the translator decided to say, and why <laughs> people in Bergson's time like to laugh at them, which obviously is terrible. And so I think that this idea of rigidity, it just kind of breaks down in this example in the sense that people do just like to laugh at things that are different and, and surprising. And it's obviously very culturally bound. I'm reminded of a woman I know went to rural China. She's riding her bicycle through rural China in a place where a lot of people had not met a Caucasian person in person. Also, it's just sort of more acceptable to make fun of people on the street <laughs> than it is in America. Like if you just fall down off your bicycle, people will point and laugh in a way that we would um, try to hide, maybe. And so this woman is telling me that on her trip through rural China, people would regularly just point at her and make this sort of beak gesture, like look at this hilarious person's nose, look at the white woman's nose, essentially. And sometimes they would actually make this sort of like um, expanding their eyes gesture, you know, with their fingers, kind of look at your giant, stupid, big eyes. And you can see there are a lot of paintings in China from the era when Europeans were colonizing, paint Europeans as quite hideous and uh, beaked noses and huge hideous bird eyes and very, a lot of hair, like disgusting, big, stabby facial hair. Europeans come off looking like these gross, pale, veiny vultures. Things that are different are funny. And then as they become less different and less surprising, they're not funny anymore. Maybe it's the case that someone who didn't have the benefit of mass media, when they saw a certain disability for the first time, they might think it's funny because it's just brand new. But once you've seen one hunchback, you've seen them all, and it's more sad than amusing. So in Bergson's theory, it, exactly. it, it turns from being comedy to being tragic when you recognize the individual, when you begin to have sympathy or feeling for it. And what I hear you describing is exactly that happening. And so that when you turn that corner, it's no longer funny. That might be a cultural norm about when you can turn that corner and go from the aggregate to the individual, go from the other to the sympathetic. But it seems to be right in line what he's saying. 
No, I do agree with that. I mean, I think that when that moment of empathy or recognition happens and the comedy sort of uh, dissipates or you feel guilty at having laughed in the first place, <laughs> since some of these examples would be appropriate. But I think that just in the initial discussion of what makes it funny in the first place before that empathy happens and the comedy dissipates, what makes it funny in the first place, I think that there's a little bit of a stretch for the rigidity thesis here. So being a professional comedian, what makes something funny? When you're thinking through your show... Or better yet, were the things you were reading about here, did some of them ring true or not? Absolutely. I mean, of course, some things rang true. And when I first started reading, my initial thought was, okay, you know, sometimes things are funny because they are too rigid, but that does not explain a lot of things like wordplay. As I continued to read, I think that I became a little more convinced that the rigidity thesis explained a lot more of comedy than I had initially thought. But I'm just not really sure that the reason that, you know, you would laugh at someone with a different facial structure than you is... I mean, I think that traditional notions of what makes something funny have to do with the element of surprise. And that might be a better description in some cases than this idea about rigidity. I mean, there are cases in which the rigidity, this rigidity idea describes things very well. In terms of how I would make a joke or why something's funny, I think that in a lot of cases, the element of surprise is, of course, important. Saying something unexpected is important. But also, I want to kind of go back to the rigidity idea here in the sense that sometimes I think that what really makes a joke funny, what really takes a funny idea and makes it into an actual funny joke has a lot to do with this word by word phrasing. And a lot of comedians will write a joke and then test it out. You know, some comedians do just get drunk and go on stage and have a blast. And then, you know, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. But some comedians are really incredibly meticulous in changing one word in a joke and then testing it and tracking how well... Some of them have spreadsheets for this to actually test one variable at a time in a joke. There was actually an article about this recently in the New York Times about the comedian Mike Kaplan and his working of a joke. I think it was called The Anatomy of a Joke. And it talks about this one joke joke and its sort of life cycle from an idea and a long monologue to eventually just this little one-liner. And one of the things they mentioned in the early incarnation of the joke, the joke was about the old chivalrous idea that when there was a mud puddle that you would take your coat off and put it down on the mud puddle for a lady to walk across and how ridiculous that was, you know, that you would ruin your whole coat so this lady doesn't have to walk in a mud puddle and then you're stuck with a muddy coat. So he's exploring that idea, which is sort of a funny idea, but it wasn't funny when I just said it, you know, I was just explaining a premise. And so he's developing this joke and he comes up with this expression that really adds to the humor. And the expression was something about, oh, really, my whole coat is less important than your lady feet bottoms? And that was the expression, lady feet bottoms. It's these little counterintuitive expressions that really push the idea over the edge in making it funny. And a lot of that has to do with specifically breaking grammatical conventions or saying something we have a word for, but using an unexpected word for it. I don't know how that idea fits in. I mean, Bergson does get around to talking about wordplay and puns, and I'm just not sure that I agree with what he has to say about that. I think that in a lot of cases, it's not over rigidity that's funny. It is the reverse. It's violating grammatical norms. Yeah, he does try to cover himself. I know I was characterizing him as giving this simplistic theory and trying to apply it to everything. But sort of at the beginning of every section, he says something like, looking at the beginning of chapter one, section five, as we hinted at the outset of this study, it would be idle to attempt to derive every comic effect from one simple formula. The formula exists well enough in a certain sense, but its development does not follow a straightforward course. What I mean is that the process of deduction ought from time to time to stop and study certain culminating effects, and that these effects appear as models round which new effects resembling them take their places in a circle. The latter are not deductions from the formula, but are comic through their relationship with those that are. In other words, yeah, there are going to be a lot of examples that don't sound like they go with my theory at all. But I'm going to lay out a series of associations that, yeah, you can sort of... It's funny because it looks like something that's actually funny. <laughs> <laughs> that really invites you to then come up with a theory that takes those, what he would consider borderline cases, like wordplay, and makes that the central thing and makes his comic characters the sort of borderline case. He does give a very detailed account of wordplay, though. It's not like he's... Yeah, no, I mean, he yeah. justifies all this stuff. I don't know. After a while, I just sort of decided I would just forgive him. And I don't really care if the theory works. I will revisit that consideration from time to time to figure out whether the theory actually does apply to everything the way he thinks it does. It's more just fun going through the exercise of trying and looking at all these different cases and seeing if you can come up with, you know, that they are some variation on this formula he's given. Although I gathered from talking to Seth that he did not find that so fun. And I have yet to hear why. Is that a challenge? I want you to talk. 
for Christ's sake. Everybody out there loves you, uh, man. Please. They want you to fucking no, talk. I guess when I started to read this, I expected there to be... I thought he was going to do more of an analysis of what makes something comic. And so, you know, initially, there were a couple of things. So he says, you know, comedy or, or laughter is something that's necessarily human and that it has a social function, right? That laughter... Laughter somehow serves a social function. That I found interesting. And the, the idea that laughter requires some kind of emotional distance, that in a certain sense, you have to be able to distance yourself from the empathetic in order to find something comical. I found that interesting. What I had to generalize when he was talking about the mechanical in something living, I sort of had to abstract a little bit from that and see it as that the comic somehow, on Bergson's theory, is I'm trying to think of how to phrase this. It makes of something, I don't want to try to define in terms of the thing we're trying to define, so I don't want to say it makes a parody, but somehow comedy represents something as almost like what it is, but not quite. And it's the way in which the representation takes place or the way in which the characterization takes place that either makes it funny or not funny. And that what tragic or the dramatic does is actually try to represent something as it is or more so as it is so that you then lose that barrier and you do empathize with the character. I suppose there's probably something to that. And we're talking about comparing stand-up. He's talking a lot about some of these comedic plays for the listeners. He makes a lot of references in the text to these French comedies, which apparently all feature doctors. So, you know, I would ask Jen this. There's a danger, right, when you're crafting a joke or when you're doing a bit of being too sympathetic or of having the audience identify too much with whatever it is you're trying to build up, that you do have to maintain this space. That idea makes sense to me. It really depends on what you're making a joke about. When we were talking about empathy, I was reminded of this comedian who I heard about who was shot in the head by her husband and uh, survived, obviously, and developed a comedy that's, act about that's this. That's not funny. And, no, it's horrifying. And when I heard that, I said, oh my God, I will do anything to avoid watching that. That is horrific. And so I have all the sympathy in the world, you know, like my sympathy is complete, but it's not funny. I don't want to see anyone try to be funny about that. Just the whole idea is horrifying. That's a place where empathy or sympathy absolutely hurts the comedy. Whereas when you're talking about something that is you just not that touchy, I mean, there's nothing wrong with total identification with the audience. I mean, there are some comedians where audience members feel that, like maybe Dane Cook, who's not my favorite comedian in the world, but I think that's someone where there are a lot of bros out there who think that they are Dane Cook. You know, there's a total identification there. And that doesn't hamper comedy mm. necessarily. Well, Sarah Silverman has this famous bit where she tries her best. She's decided, I'm going to try to make, I'm going to make rape funny. Okay. That's an excellent example to bring up because she's somebody who I can find funny and horrifying within the same like three minute span. I'm glad that you mentioned that example because I've done a lot of all women comedy events and I put a lot of thought into just what happens when you have a comedy event that's mostly women or dominated by women and how things kind of change. And, you know, Sarah Silverman absolutely is an example of someone who's funny and sort of horrifying at the same time. But it's also the case that there are some people who are really turned off in terms of comedy if there's something that would... There definitely are people who don't like Sarah Silverman, of course. And I'm reminded of this comic, and I honestly, I can't remember her name, but it was so interesting because she had a joke about rape, but it was a joke that... A bunch of feminist blogs were saying somebody finally made a funny rape joke. You know, George Carlin had tried and Sarah Silverman had tried. And this comic finally nailed it. And it was a joke about how women walk around being afraid of rape all the time. And the punchline, this is like, if you want to look it up, this is how you would find it. It's essentially the story of, you know, walking through a dark alley and so on and so forth. And when the rape finally comes, you say, oh, you know, it's finally here. That's my rape. You know, like the one you've been expecting this whole time. <laughs> That's my rape. Finally happened. Here it is. That would be ever Maynard. Oh, good. I like to make sure people get credit for their jokes. So, you know, and the lady blogosphere was just alight with the idea that someone finally made a funny rape joke. It had taken, you know, this much human evolution for that to happen. And so I think that that's, again, it's a case where you're not horrified by the joke. I mean, you're horrified by rape. You're horrified by the situation in society. But your identification with the comedian is complete. You know, there's no distance there. That comedian is exactly like you. 
I think identification, though, is different than, say, really empathizing with an emotion. Well, when we say empathy, I mean, is it necessary with empathy to assume that we're talking about something bad happening? There are lots of jokes that don't necessarily depend on that sort of premise. Right. But the idea is that there's some emotion, right, that the comic... This isn't necessarily the stand-up comedian telling the joke. It's whoever is the butt of the joke. The idea is that if there's empathy with whatever emotion that they would naturally be going through in that situation, say, someone being terrified of being raped, then suddenly you have to take it seriously and it kind of kills the comedy. It's really hard to hold one's actual empathy as in, you know, I'm sharing now this feeling of terror that someone would have if they were in danger of being raped with the comic moment. I think that's a perfect example of where we actually distance ourselves from empathizing with the feeling of terror to say, you know, yeah, there's my rape. We're not thinking at all about the feeling of terror there, where we have to take some sort of distance from it. I think it's a bears out Bergson's theory there. I think personally that that kind of reaction is my default reaction to anything actually scary or dangerous that I recall driving and like I lose control of the car on the ice and the car is just spinning around and I just started laughing my ass off that this is mm -hmm. like it's just a distancing thing. It's a coping mechanism. It's gallows humor. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a close relationship between what is tragic and what is comic there's always the danger of crossing the line and one sort of spills over in, into the other. And as we saw in the case of deformity, that line will shift for different cultures and different times. But also Bergson sort of prizes this when he's talking about words in the second chapter. He really goes into detail into this notion of transposition, where you get the transposition of the natural expression of an idea into another key, he calls it. So his example, he uses this quote from Jean-Paul Richter. The sky was beginning to change from black to red, like a lobster being boiled. And that's a transposition from the solemn to the familiar. And actually, a lot of the examples we've been giving have been of that sort of transposition, either of the solemn to the familiar, something that's inherently tragic or dangerous or into its opposite. Even the case with the code being laid down on the muddy puddle, it's supposed to be chivalrous. It's supposed to be it's something that in our empathetic moment, we would take that seriously as that, oh, that's so chivalrous and nice. And we have to take, let's say, an ironic distance in order to see the absurdity of it, which is the my whole coat is worth the, your lady feet bottom. I think that's what you said. Right? <laughs> yeah, that was it. Right. Anything that's become a cliche, it's hard to not have that distance from it. If you actually were going to do that, if you're actually going to lay your coat on a puddle for somebody, they're going to laugh at you and you're going to laugh while you're doing it because it's just freaking ridiculous. Yeah. And there's the element of repetition, which is what transpositions through Bergson is one of the instances of this element of repetition that he talks about. And for us, it's a cultural repetition, right? There's nothing individual or unique anymore about the puddle thing because it's a meme in culture. It's a cliche. If no one had ever done that or no one had ever heard of it, and then they did that for someone, it has a good chance of being romantic because it's actually individual. It doesn't fall under this type where the cliche, right, gives us the automatism and that air of the mechanical, right? I'm just doing something that's been done before. And that's where the comic element supposedly comes in. In this section in my book, it's on page 63, he's contrasting a little bit irony and humor. And he goes on, says that, Humor is emphasized the deeper we go down into an evil that actually is, in order to set down its details in the most cold-blooded indifference. If our analysis is correct, several authors, Jean Paul amongst them, have noticed that humor delights in concrete terms, technical details, definite facts. If our analysis is correct, this is not an accidental trait of humor, it is its very essence. A humorist is a moralist disguised as a scientist, something like an anatomist who practices dissection for the sole object of filling us with disgust. So that humor in the restricted sense in which we are here regarding the word is really a transposition from the moral to the scientific. It reminds me of the way in which I see humor working where you take something that is awful, for instance, and you bring it down to just really talking about very nitty nitty details. In fact, it wouldn't have to be awful. There's a lot of comedy, it seems to me, that just works on that kind of dissection and has us look at that individual piece all by itself. And it's not clear to me why it becomes funny when you do that, but it does. I think he had in mind, like Mark Twain here, that kind of stuff. That yeah. Is caustic social commentary. Yeah, it's a very specific subtype of what's laughable in general. 
So he says, irony is we state what ought to be done and pretend to believe that it is just what is actually being done. That's irony. And then for humor, we describe with scrupulous minuteness what is being done and pretend to believe that this is just what ought to be done. I can't think of a good example of that offhand. Irony, it says, is emphasized the higher we allow ourselves to be uplifted by the idea of the good that ought to be. Thus, irony may grow so hot within us that it becomes a kind of high-pressure eloquence. On the other hand, humor is more emphasized the deeper we go into an evil that already is in order to set down its detail. Yeah, as, as you were saying. I'm just trying to remember what he means by irony here, since it's obviously not exactly what we say. Yeah, he's usually good for examples, but he breaks down at some points and you sort of go for stretches with these categories and we don't get a real concrete sense of what they mean. Are all notions of irony, just speaking ironically, I mean, are those just a matter of the same kind of gallows humor distance I was referring to? Well, it's like rain on your wedding day, right? <laughs> irony is a pop song in which you call lots of things ironic, none of which are ironic. They're just inconvenient. So rain on your wedding day is inconvenient, but it's not ironic because it's not contrary to expectation. What would be ironic is if you had just promised your firstborn so that there would not be rain on your wedding day. And then, oh, man. Exactly. No, that, that, I believe there's a Greek tragedy that goes somewhat like that. And that's <laughs> neither ironic nor comic. But here he's saying, you know, we state what ought to be done and pretend to believe that it is just what is actually being done. Yeah, I'm unclear. I don't know. All the examples I can come up with could be analyzed in some other way. Like if you have perfectly villainous characters while they're murdering somebody talking about what they're going to have for lunch or debating some fine point of the ethics of what they're doing of, no, I want to have the last poke with the sword or something like that. But that sounds more like just that juxtaposition of two incongruous elements there you know there's a serious thing going on but it's being treated lightly or whatever irony is a subtype of this incongruity what he calls transposition right so right. he talks of the extremes which is where we get it's either exaggeration of size and physical dimensions or making the best the worst or the worst the best so those are two types of the most extreme transposition and then what he calls the subtle transpositions we get real versus ideal that's where we get irony and humor this contrast between real and ideal both are satirical. I think what's supposed to be important for the contrast is that the two things that are being contrasted, like there's two different situations being juxtaposed, the serious situation of two people murdering somebody and then the comic situation of them, you know, well, after you do something, then you have to go and have lunch. So maybe they're talking about where, where they're going to go and have lunch while they're doing this horrible thing. So there's the clash. But the point is that each of them sort of has its own internal logic. And what makes it sort of like the interface mm. between automaton and the organic is if we have these two organic things that are just stuck together, really any kind of 